Have you ever thought about opening your own mobile card or kiosk business? Maybe the facility you manage could establish new revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. Cart King International can be the answer to your needs. Cart King is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile coffee, food, and retail carts and kiosks. Cart King has been working with clients and corporations across North America for 20 years, providing innovative designs, custom manufacturing, and timely delivery. Carts and kiosks are fun, and so are the dozens of designs on our website. Please visit us today at www.cart-king.com or just call us at 1-877-986-7771 and get your sales rolling. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I have dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, seven days a week. Just log into kmdlaw.com. That's kmdlaw.com. Or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW. That's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents. They handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be. Because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMDLaw. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMDLaw. PureSoapFlakes.com, 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with pure soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. They have a little promotion going on. Contact them to order some soap. Mention the Opperman Report. You're going to get a free gift. They're going to send a little extra soap, travel size, soap bars, and laundry soap, cleaning soap flakes. I've been using that stuff all day long today. Great stuff. Order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call. 218-568-2525. 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising floodwaters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. You can look them up online at aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. And you call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of new world order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, You can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting through my website, emailrevealer.com. Uh, we also have a member section over at OppermanReport.com where you can find all kind of exclusive content you won't hear on the air. Uh, and then also, too, um, I'm doing a new 
live weekly video podcast at getvocal.com, G-E-T-V-O-K-L.com, uh, every Thursday evening, 7 p.m. Uh, as always, you can find our archives at Spreaker.com, including two previous interviews I've done with our guests today, uh, Stephen Singular and his wife, Joyce Singular. Uh, you can check them out at their website, stephensingular.com, which is with, spelled with a P-H, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Singular. Dot com where they update all their appearances. They got, we got a ton of things coming up. Uh, they're going to be on CNN in July. They got uh, a new book coming out in September about killer cults and a reels documentary coming out too. I believe uh, um, that was about the BTK. Coming. The Warren Jeffs story. Yeah. Warren Jeffs, which we had John about before. Right. Fascinating FDLS uh, case up there. So uh, let's start the Stephen Singular. Can you tell us about yourself? Who is Stephen Singular? Well, let's see. I was uh, born in rural Kansas, and I studied history in college at the University of Kansas, went to New York City in 1973, and sort of stumbled into journalism, uh, just kind of by accident, and moved to Denver in 1981, and stumbled into writing my first book, which was about the neo-Nazi assassination of a, a prominent and controversial talk show host in Denver named Alan Berg. For those who've seen the Oliver Stone movie Talk Radio, it is loosely based upon the Berg story. Uh, the Berg story has kind of resonated, resonated for the last uh, 36 years through American culture with, uh, as I said, he was killed by neo-Nazis in that year. But we've had the white nationalist movement lately. We've even had white nationalists kind of trying to take advantage of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic lately trying to recruit members and their stories about there out there about that so that whole sort of rise of the radical violent right has been a, i think an important story ever since berg was killed and from there i've gone on and written a number of books about high profile crimes and joyce has worked with me on a number of them and co-authored the last two yeah, that whole uh, neo-Nazi thing spilled over into the Mark Furman uh, book. That's that correct. There was uh, I, We were both very involved in the O.J. Simpson case uh, because of my prior work in investigating neo-Nazis. And I was told early on in, in the Simpson case that there were connections and tendrils into this that case uh, from the prior book on neo-Nazis at the time. It sounded rather far-fetched, but when you get to the primary investigator on the case in the critical first hours of the investigation, uh, come to find out, you know, he has ideas about uh, rounding up all African Americans and everything else that's uh, somewhat similar or quite similar to the first book I wrote about. So to just give a tagline to that, if, if we could... Uh, uh, when Christopher Darden, the, one of the prosecutors on the case, wrote his uh, book uh, called In Contempt on the Simpson case, he said that the defense came not from Johnny Cochran and Robert Shapiro and all those folks, but from a true crime writer in Colorado who, by the way, didn't receive a nickel for any of that work that he did. So if people are really interested in, in pursuing that, they can find the book Legacy of Deception on Amazon Kindle. It was updated in 2016, came out in 96. And I think they would find a quite very different take on the Simpson case from 98% of what they've read and learned some new things. Yeah, I would encourage people to go back into our archives and find my first interview with Stephen Singular uh, about that Mark Furman book, uh, Legacy of Deception. Excellent body of work from Stephen Singular. Now, uh, Joyce, we heard about Stephen stumbling around. Why don't you, how did you stumble into <laughs> Stephen's life? And uh, tell well, us about yourself. Um, Steve and I have been married almost 30 years. And when we first met, we both shared an interest in true crime the psychology behind it. Um, we were both fascinated by Truman Capote's book in Cold Blood. And so when I first met Steve, I started accompanying him to murder trials here in the local Denver area. And I've, I started um, finding out that I could provide another point of view, you know, the the old adage, two heads are better than one, we, kind of, we found out that two genders are better than one, because I see things through a different filter, of course, being a woman, and we started putting our, our viewpoints together and finding out that not only was it sort of easier to interview people, they weren't as intimidated by just one lone male uh, investigative journalist, but a couple with a small child 
that kind of opened the door to people to be a little bit more relaxed. And so when we would have um, two book contracts at the same time, for example, I would cover a murder trial come back, bring my notes to Steve, and then we would work together and put our notes together and form a narrative, generally through, um, you know, the court uh, documents that we would get. So um, throughout the years, I've worked on several, uh, most of the true crime books, including the, the uh O.J. Simpson, John Benet Ramsey, the BTK, uh, the Internet's first serial killer, uh, John Robinson in Kansas, um, the Aurora Theater Shooter, the Warren Jeffs book. Uh, we've both recently worked on um, another book called Killer Cults about um, high-profile cult leaders and also very obscure ones. So, yeah, we've been working together a long time, and we find that we work very well together because we just share the same interest in the, what, what drives people, what's the psychological motives behind, you know, a people committing aberrant behavior. Yeah, I encourage people to, to head over to stephensingler.com. All the topics he covers, and this couple covers in their books, is all the stuff my audience is into. So I really encourage you to follow their work. This is really high-quality investigative reporting here. Now, guys, you're, you're well known for your, for your uh, research, your work, your investigation into the John Benet Ramsey case. Uh, why don't you tell us, uh, remind the audience about what was that case and, and give us an idea, an overview of your uh, investigation. Well, in December 26, uh, 1996, John Benet, six years old, uh, known as being a child beauty pageant queen, was found in her parents' basement. Uh, five days later, this had set off a media frenzy, as many will recall. And five days later, Joyce was watching the first major interview that the Ramsey couple, John and Patsy, gave on CNN, January 1st, 1997. I was in another room. She sort of called me in and said, hey, you know, this is 30 miles from where we live. Uh, we should look into this. And I was like, well, there are 10,000 people covering this. I don't, I don't see much of an opportunity there, but as is often the case, her instincts were right. We went to a, uh, a press conference, the first one held in Boulder in mid-January, and uh, I'm going to let Joyce tell you what happened at that uh, press conference because it was sort of a pivotal moment about two to three weeks into the case. Well, what happened was we met a, uh, a reporter from a local television station here in Denver, and she invited us to go. She was aware of Steve's first book, Talk, Talk to Death, of course. Um, so she invited us to go to the television station one snowy night. This is just maybe a few weeks after John Bonet had been murdered. And we, like everybody else, thought that there was some you know, predator out there and we didn't know, we were very frightened. I was particularly frightened because I had a young child about the same age as John Monet. And we, I, you know, couldn't believe that if somebody could actually go into your home in the middle of the night and kill your child and leave your child in your basement and nobody heard anything, then other people like me were thinking, well, who's out there? What, what is, what's going on 30 miles from us? So we went to the radio or to the television station that one night and they had a hacker there and you have to remember this was in the, the really the infancy of the internet nobody really knew about the dark web at that time people there didn't even really know about you know the regular internet at that time so they had a hacker there and they had, there was a few other people besides us and we watched as this hacker went into a site where there was um, it was a very underground type of site and there were chil young children, young girls about the same age as John Binet, uh, done up in masochistic or sadistic types of um, positions like John Binet had been found with like garrots around their neck and their hands tied and very, very S&M, BDSM types of, you know, poses for young girls, which was highly disturbing to see. And then he typed in something like, um, does anybody have pictures of John Binet? And it was like this feeding frenzy. Everybody was asking, um, dead or alive? And we had never seen anything like this before. Well, and what you realize, I mean, sitting there, I mean, child pornography was obviously very hard to transfer, you know, in, in earlier times through the mail or anything else suddenly you realize there's a worldwide market, underground market for this stuff, 
And it's, you know, the people who were responding online were from all over the place, and they were willing to trade pictures of their own children or sell things, and you realize this is a business, and it's a completely underground criminal activity. So that was sort of the doorway into looking at this. Well, what does, it, what does that particularly involve? Well, it involves photography, or it involves video, and, and, and those kinds of things. So one of the next things we did was start talking to pageant mothers and as we as everyone knows patsy ramsey was a pageant mother in the denver boulder area and john benet was a a winning uh, little beauty queen and so we started talking to the mothers who had interacted with patsy and been in the same events and all of those things and we heard one story over and over again and that story was that john benet's primary photographer whose name is randy simons uh you know personal pageant photographer had completely freaked out in the aftermath of the crime and he he had been a very normal person up until this point he was now calling these mothers in the middle of the night screaming and crying i did not kill john benet i did not kill john benet so this was obviously you know setting off some some bells and whistles for us he also told a story about you know, being pressured into selling or not selling certain images of John Benet that were much sought after in the aftermath of crime. We all know that her image was appearing everywhere on television, magazines. So suddenly, you know, he emerges as this rather uh, suspicious character. In the in the aftermath of the crime, the whole reporting on it was there'll be a, a, an arrest made imminently. The parents will be arrested and they, we will find out that they killed their child in one form or another. A uh, hundred days went on, there was no arrest, there was no legal movement of any kind, and I decided to contact the district attorney of Boulder, Alex Hunter, and just called him up, and surprisingly, very surprisingly, he said, well, you know, why don't you come on in and, you know, tell me what you've been looking into. So I went over to Boulder and, and laid out the things that we're talking about here, the Internet, disturbing images, the, the pageant mothers and their stories. You know, did they even know who Randy Simons was? Well, and, and not just Randy Simons, but the pageant mothers were saying that there were certain photographers that they knew well enough to never leave their child alone with them. Because when you think about it, if you go into a, a, a photographer's studio, and, and the, your child has to go into a fitting room and change their clothes. One would never know if there could be a camera recording them, that type of thing. Or, mm. you know, the people surrounding the beauty pageant circuits, the sponsors, the judges, people that attend them, the whole atmosphere could be, you know, it, it could be the type of situation where people could get stimulated by seeing little girls dressed up as, as adult women with lots of makeup and provocative, you know, moves and, and the costumes. So it, we're not saying that Randy Simons was a suspect in the murder, but we, we think there was some sort of knowledge of this underground world of photographers that had to make money off of not only just, you know, right. photographing young girls, but then maybe possibly putting their heads, the heads of the, the, the more pretty ch children on heads of other children. We even interviewed mothers who said they were approached about this. I mean, you were getting digital photography that could be manipulated in any number of ways. Again, this is very underground. <clears throat> and you could, you know, there were already stories emerging about, you know, manipulating photographs like that. Take someone's pretty head and put it on a different body, et cetera, and then sell the image. So we're going to circle back to Randy Simons later on in this story, but that's an important name to remember. Alex Hunter, the district attorney, had a, you know, they didn't know who Randy Simons was. He said the Boulder police are fixated solely on the, on the Ramsey parents. They don't want to broaden the investigation to look into some of these other areas. <clears throat> and he asked me if I would, you know, sort of go out and look more into that and, and report back to him, which is about as stunning a thing as a district attorney could say to a reporter uh, imaginable. I mean, it's the most visible case in Colorado history, surrounded by controversy, and he's asking somebody essentially to go 
you know, look into something that's and illegal. interfere in the investigation. <laughs> interfere in the investigation. Yeah. Have a parallel, you know, I, a I, parallel I, I, investigation, yeah. basically. It showed, but it, it reflected that's, how narrowly the police were looking at the case. Yeah. And, you know, the whole rumor was Patsy's an abusive mother. You know, she did this to her daughter out of some, you know, frustration or anger. John's a pedophile. Uh, he obviously was abusing her. I mean, there was not one scintilla of truth in any of these reports. No report of Patsy ever laying a hand on the child. Nothing to tie John into those things. So what that immediately or what that sort of tells you is you've got to broaden your investigation. You know, you've got to look out beyond the family and see what you can find. So this was the kind of the sticking point right from the beginning, and I think it's why the case isn't solved today. There were some allegations that John Ramsey had some kind of porn on his computer. What did you find out about that? That was never, ever verified. They tore the family, the house, the business, Access Graphics, apart. And they, there was no, I mean, I think that would be a headline in the Globe if we could, you know, back that one up. <laughs> Here's the tape that John Ramsey had in his house, um, if, if that existed. And it didn't exist. What did exist was a subculture around the child beauty pageant realm where mothers told us personally, as Joyce has already said, we attracted people who were dangerous. We told those people they mm-hmm. could not be around our children, you know, during these events. There was a natural criminal or at least somewhat criminal subculture surrounding that and by definition surrounding the child. Why wouldn't you put a lot of investigative resources into that? And that was sort of the, the, the question that, that hangs over this. Uh, the families that, were, were, that noticed this, these, these patterns, were they making police reports? Were there, were there any arrests regarding this kind of activity? There were not. There, there were not, and okay. that's an excellent question. And I think it was more, it was more anecdotal. But, but the thing about not allowing your child to be alone with some of these people, there was, you know, the radar was up to that level. I, but I, I do not believe they were filing police reports. What else did you find in your investigation? Well, we, we found uh, that um, we began to hear about various parties that were held in Boulder. And the parties were, people would talk about people bringing their children to these events, and then there being parties after the party where more uh, suspect things would go on, would go on with children. And we were, were learning more about that. There were certain names that came up in connection with that. I conveyed some of those names to the district attorney. There were, um, I went to the Boulder County Jail at one point and talked to a child predator, and he gave me some information about people in Boulder who were engaged in these kinds of activities. And so for about, a, well, about six or eight months, uh, we accumulated information of this nature and, and, and fed it back into the, into the district attorney and into the Boulder legal system. There was very little activity taken around that kind of thing. Again, the, the fixation was on the parents. And then the uh, district attorneys changed, too. Well, the, the district attorney himself, at a given point, he was told not to be talking to outsiders and... Uh, and so that kind of shut down the level of communication. But the the story, of course, is that that arrest never came. I mean, it was going to come in the first two weeks, the first two months, uh, the first two years, but there was a problem with the case. And what was that? The problem was that there were three different, two to three different samples of DNA on John Binet in all the wrong places, Uh, Some of the samples were mixed, implying that there may have been multiple offenders, but there was at least one sample from a male that came up in more than one example. 
So you have, that is a very major problem if you're going to prosecute the parents for the murder of their child, because you would have to explain away the DNA and they couldn't do that. You said that you uncovered some names and locations where these activities were taking place. Would we recognize those names and locations? If I don't say them think so. You would have to be extremely familiar with the case. And I don't want to talk, talk about that because no one has ever been charged in this case. But I remember um, uncovering something about a very prominent person in Boulder uh, and, and taking it to Hunter Alex Hunter, the district attorney, and he was just shocked. And he said, uh, you know, are you certain this is the right person on all of that? But what he said that was more important, I think more significant in our conversation is that he, he said, what are you going to do with that information? And he very clearly did not want me to publicize anything and said, in effect, Boulder has been really hurt by this, and this would not do us any good. So that becomes kind of a foundational uh, sentence and thought for what's going to happen next in this story. How widespread were, were these uh, locations, these names, in, in, in terms of numbers of people and We were given two or this? three places that were rather public places. Um, so you're talking about a fairly significant number of individuals. I don't mean thousands. I mean, you know, maybe 30, maybe 40, maybe 50. I don't, I don't know for sure, but some of them were associated with public uh, outlets. Some were associated with individuals and, you know, private houses. And, and we, all, we also worked um, for a while with private investigators that were hired first by the, the Boulder Police Department and then later by the Ramseys. Um, High-profile investigators, one was Lou Smith and the other was Ollie Gray. And they both confirmed with us that there were these types of parties going on in the area and that it, it was known, you know, it, but it was not something that people wanted to bring out. And they both said that it was their strong belief that photography or video was involved in the crime. And they wouldn't go into great detail. Lou Smith was a renowned homicide investigator in Colorado Springs with a 90 plus, 90 percent plus clearance rate on his cases. And Ollie Gray was a former <clears throat> police officer in California and Houston with a very good track record. So, I mean, these were high level people. And they were approached by law enforcement to help the law enforcement with the case, and they both effectively quit because law enforcement wouldn't expand the investigation. Now, I believe, too, there was an autopsy showed some type of physical damage to John Benet Ramsey that indicated sexual abuse. Am I correct? Yeah, that? well, this has always been an area of ambiguity. This is, this is, you can get one doctor to say one thing and you can get one doctor to say another. But I think, that, I think you can make that assumption rather safely. And do you come to a conclusion that the parents were aware of this uh, activity against their daughter, or, or were they oblivious to this? We have come to the conclusion that they were as oblivious to the ultimate circumstances as they were to what they were exposing her to in the child beauty pageant circuit. There were stories about certain photographs that were in the Randy Simon studio, and I don't mean hardcore, ch hardcore child pornography, but things that are more on the borderline with girls that are older than John Bonet. And I was told, we were told that Patsy was in there and looking around, and you know, you can kind of see where what the subculture was, and she was oblivious to the to the. Uh, to the situation that was there. So I, naive, naivety is not a crime, and I think the naivety here was extremely strong. We interviewed John Ramsey face-to-face -face on a couple of occasions. He came to our house in 20, 2017 and 18 and spent quite a bit of time. And he is one of the most tight-lipped individuals that you'll ever be around. He has a great way of saying nothing. 
But he kept saying over and over again, we thought Boulder was a nice town. We thought it was a nice place to come to to raise our children. You know, that that's what we thought about this community. And while you have to extrapolate a little bit out of that, what I got from it was we did not, well, and he effectively almost said, we did not know what was going on around our family. And I believe that's a true statement. So, no, we are not sitting here saying that the Ramseys somehow explicitly, uh, you know, did something with their daughter that resulted in her death. And when we get to the grand jury part of this, which is critical, we will talk more about that. Okay, we've got to take a little commercial break. So, uh, perhaps when we get back, we'll get right into that. But I also want to know what you think happened that night. Uh, so we're talking to Stephen Singular and Joyce Singular. Uh, the book is called Presumed Guilty, an investigation of the John Bonet Ramsey case, the media, and the culture of pornography. Now, the book first came out in 1999, but it's been updated to a digital format uh, in 2016 after the grand jury report came out in t- 2013. Uh, so you can find all these updates and stuff at their website, stephensingular.com, and that's Stephen spelt with a PH. Uh, we'll be right back with more of a Stephen and Joyce Singular right after these messages. And now a word from our sponsors. Have you ever thought about opening your own mobile card or kiosk business? Maybe the facility you manage could establish new revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. Cart King International can be the answer to your needs. Cart King is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile coffee, food, and retail carts and kiosks. Cart King has been working with clients and corporations across North America for 20 years, providing innovative designs, custom manufacturing, and timely delivery. Carts and kiosks are fun, and so are the dozens of designs on our website. Please visit us today at www.cart-king.com or just call us at 1-877-986-7771 and get your sales rolling. Thank you so much for listening to the Opperman Report. I want to welcome all our new listeners at WWPR 1490 AM in the Tampa Bay area. We're brand new down here. We're getting a nice warm welcome. We have great advertising opportunities for local sponsors, local businesses, but also international websites and international companies too. We're on our other stations in California, Nevada, Utah, and on the internet worldwide. But down here in Tampa Bay, Florida, we have some great opportunities for you to come in and get very, very affordable advertising rates. Get a hold of me at OppermanReport at gmail.com and we'll cut you a good deal. PureSoapFlakes.com, 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with Pure Soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. They have a little promotion going on. Contact them to order some soap. Mention the Opperman Report. You're going to get a free gift. They're going to sing a little extra soap, travel size, soap bars, and laundry soap, cleaning soap flakes. I've been using that stuff all day long today. Great stuff. Order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call. 218-568-2525. 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising floodwaters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. 
You can look them up online at aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. You call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, we're here today with Stephen Singular and Joyce Singular, uh, co-authors of the book Presumed Guilty, an Investigation of the John Bonet Ramsey Case, the Media, and the Culture of Pornography. Uh, guys, before we get into the grand jury report, what do you think happened that night? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, in any, in any aspect of this case, there has to be some level of speculation. And it does tie into the grand jury report, so that, that becomes significant. You have to remember that from the very beginning of this case, it was an either-or case. Either the Ramseys, there are only two camps here, either the Ramseys killed their daughter and they're guilty, or an intruder came into the house and killed the child, and the Ramseys are totally innocent. Well, also, also that some people speculated that that Burke, her her nine year old brother, did it too. Right. After the, all those programs came out on the twentieth anniversary of Germany's death a few years ago, that that theory was floated out there, and a lot of people started believing that one too. And there's a lot of talk on the internet still about Burke committing this crime. Yeah. So either someone in that Ramsey house, a Ramsey killed the child, or an intruder did it. So if you look at the case, maybe as an investigative reporter, you might say this is A and this is Z. Now there's a lot of space in between A and Z and what might be in that space. Presumed Guilty is the only book ever published that asks that question. I, I feel confident in saying that, and there have been a lot of Ramsey books. Could there be something in the middle where neither uh, one is, is absolutely the case. So we were looking into the idea that, number one, that there is a middle ground there that needs to be investigated. Number two, that it's not an absolute given that John Bonet died inside that house. You know, there's no blood present. She was bashed over the head or she had a severe head wound. And both Ollie Gray and Lou Smith brought up the fact that there's no blood present in the basement where she was found, and they both found that highly suspect. And they were both open to the notion that she didn't necessarily die inside the house. So we have speculated, and that's a very important word, that maybe the crime took place somewhere else, and there are two different crime scenes. It would account for fibers on her body, which don't relate to anything that was found in the house. It would relate to the duct tape that was found over her mouth that was never sourced within the side of the house. And it, it would relate to the DNA, the critical DNA samples that belong to unknown individual or individuals, nobody inside the house. So we have examined the idea that she was somewhere else that night. We know that the Ramseys went to a party. We know that they left about 9 o'clock. We do not know that she was with them when they left the house. The story they tell is that they made a stop on the way or a stop or two on the way to deliver Christmas presents to people, but John Bonet was not with them when they went in that house. And it's also important to bring up that John Bonet and this is corroborated by several people, said that she was going to be meeting with a secret Santa on Christmas night. Right. And, her, and, and her mother asked her, but, but, or said, John Bonet, you know, that's not when Santa comes. He comes on Christmas Eve. But John Bonet said, told several people, and I think two at least we know for sure, that there was a secret Santa that she was going to be meeting with on the night of Christmas, which would be the night of the 25th. We believe that it's possible that something was set up for that night and that she was allowed to go there. Again, this is speculation. And I, we do not believe that her parents knew what the event was. And we have had firsthand accounts of the stories of Patsy perhaps letting her go. Um, and we have uh, other information that was shared after the uh, the crime that's a little too sensitive to go into at this point. But 
So that opens up that possibility, which was, as a matter of fact, floated in the 1999 version of the book. In 2013, October, the Boulder Daily Camera sued the district attorney's office. They were a new district attorney. And uh, to get the grand jury report, which was an 18-page report on the case, if you'll recall what I said earlier, when I took the information to Alex Hunter about a, a prominent person in town, his major concern was protecting Boulder, not figuring out what this person might have known or done. The grand jury report, which is based on a 13-month investigation with tens of thousands of pages and who knows how many witnesses, Hunter decided to seal permanently, in perpetuity, so that the public, which had paid for that investigation that ran into the millions of dollars, could never know what the grand jury uncovered and what they felt should be done legally. Fourteen years later, the camera won a partial victory, and four of the pages of the 18 pages were released. Most important legal document ever to come out of the Ramsey case. And what what the papers, what the four pages said was, the Ramseys exposed their daughter to the person who killed her, a first degree murder. In Colorado, no one under the age of 10 can be charged with a felony. That sentence tells you that Burke Ramsey did not commit the crime. This was a first degree murder mm-hmm. case based upon adult homicide. They exposed their daughter to it. The second count, count seven, said that they covered up the crime. They participated in the cover-up. So what do we have here? What's in front of us from the only people legally bound to study the case for 13 months and come to a conclusion? And that is that the Ramseys, what they're saying is partially guilty, partially innocent that they did not kill their daughter, that they exposed her to the person or people who did, and then they participated after the fact. That's a legal conclusion. That's not me saying it or Joyce saying it. That's a legal conclusion completely ignored by the media. So, in other words, what they're saying is it's not an either-or case. So, presumed guilty had said that in 1999, It had taken a lot of heat for saying that in 1999, and 14 years later, the corroborating evidence of that was coming out in a legal document. And the real question is, why can't we see, why can't the public know what else was said in the grand jury report? I mean, that's a big if, that's a big question. And why was the report buried in perpetuity? Why would the district attorney go out of his way to keep this information from the public? That's the question. And, and if if the report points to a, a killer, you know that they exposed the child to. Why is it absolutely that can't be in charge? Yeah. Why were the Ramseys not taken into court? Why was I mean the, the, the counts are right there. You know they're right in front of you. That that yeah, right. that's felon felonious behavior. <laughs> Why was pressure not applied? Why were they not taken into court for what they were going to be accused of, you know, which was a cover-up of a crime, not first-degree murder? First-degree murder is hard to prove. Everybody knows that, especially with conflicting DNA. This accessory, you know, is not that difficult. That's the fundamental question of the case that's not getting asked. What other names were in that grand jury report? Right. 14 pages completely unexplored or seen what was in there is there any more litigation to try to unseal these uh, there's been talk about it but the the the, you know that was as far a judge was you know put in charge of deciding what to release I mean it's very curious legal circumstances Mm -hmm. if you think about it I think there was a judge initially who recused himself I'm not positive about that. But the judge that actually ruled on it said, you know, you get these few breadcrumbs and we're going to keep the rest of it from you. So people have talked about relitigating, resuing, you know, but that, that takes some resources and clout. What would motivate the Ramses to commit the crime? Threats. Threats. Yeah. The threat of, 
you know, this something got out of hand here. And uh, let's let's look at John Ramsey for just a minute. Let's let's extend John Ramsey the presumption of innocence, which I think is the right thing to do when it comes to murder. And I think it's the right thing to do with his wife. And I know it's the right thing to do with his son. He has a daughter who's killed in a car wreck in uh, 1992 or something. I'm not sure about that. Now he has a six-year-old daughter savagely murdered and under highly, highly questionable circumstances with someone's DNA all over her body in the wrong places. And I think it's not too far-fetched to speculate that people did not want what happened here to come out. And I think it's exactly what Alex Hunter did. And I think it's why the Ramsey's public posture appeared so ambiguous when they appeared in public. That, that what people were jumping to the conclusion, well, they killed their daughter, they're obviously guilty. It's not what the evidence shows. The evidence shows a far more complicated set of circumstances. People always jump to conclusions about how they think people should be behaving when they see them appearing after, you know, someone close to them has been murdered. And you can't really put yourself in those person in those people's positions. You don't know people react differently. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, and and so if you want to conclude as many have they that they were involved in certain activities after the crime, perhaps in creating the ransom note, perhaps in other things. A lot of people have said that. That may be accurate. That is effectively what the grand jury concluded. You said this would circle around back to that photographer, uh, Mr. Simmons. What, what do we... Well, so we, we followed him around uh, a bit repertorially uh, in October of 1997 well if you go back about 30 minutes in our conversation we said that he was calling up pageant mother screaming and crying I did not kill John Benet in October of 97 which was about 8-9 months later he was arrested walking naked down the street in a very small town in eastern Colorado and when the police approached him uh, nude as could be, he said, I did not kill John Benet. I did not kill John Benet. We received reports. He relocated to the Northwest um, uh, states, and we received a report a number of years ago. Well, wait a minute. He was arrested for what is public indecency? Was that yeah. it was when he was walking around that town nude like that? Yeah. But his DNA was tested, and it was not what was found on John Bonet. We believe that he may very well have had knowledge of the subculture around John Bonet that had tendrils into her death. We never contended that he was present when the when the murder happened. So go ahead, Joyce, with what, what we heard from you know, the woman who called us. Well, no, like I said, that throughout the years, you know, because of the website, we, we get tips on many of the of the crimes that we've covered and in and in one instance um several years ago we got a, a a tip from a woman that was living in the same trailer court as as randy simons and she googled his name because she felt uncomfortable around her her granddaughter her very young granddaughter his presence around the grandchild was unnerving her so what she did was she googled his name came up in the book presumed guilty, and she contacted us to say that she had felt uncomfortable. Okay, so now we flash forward to 2019, summer of 2019. July 3rd, Randy Simon is arrested in Oregon on multiple counts of child pornography, um, I guess related to his computer. So the story kind of comes around full circle. He was suspect. As far as we know, he wasn't really investigated. We always felt there was a video uh, photography potential connection into this case. Now he's busted for child pornography. And he was supposed to go on trial last month, April 2020, but the... COVID-19 virus knocked that down. He was also released from prison in the last couple of weeks because 
he because of the virus uh, so his case is uh, somewhat up in the air but the real question here becomes what have the boulder police done in connection to this if anything and they may not have done anything at all but here's a guy whose behavior has been suspect for 20 years he clearly has illicit images or alleged illicit images on his computers we don't know the extent of that we don't know what his connections are we always felt that computer images could can very well be a part of this case so you would like to think that maybe boulder would have picked up on this but there is absolutely no guarantee that that's happened you said earlier that you felt that the the ramses were silenced due to threats now uh, do you know anyone else in this case that's been threatened and have you guys been threatened uh no not well, somewhat. Well, one yeah. time, the, well, after the grand jury report came out, we did write a letter to the editor stating what we've been talking about with you today, about how the book lays out this other scenario that could have happened b- besides the intruder theory or that the Ramsey did it or that Burke did it. And after that letter was mm-hmm. published, we, we did get a letter mailed to our home saying, anonymous. you know, anonymous letter saying, you know, Patsy did it. Don't don't talk about this anymore. I mean, yeah, it gets your attention when people are trying to silence you. And I was named in a in a criminal complaint. That's too long of a story to get into by someone who was, you know, at points various points considered a suspect in the case. And we got a little too close to that at times. And also, so. we have we have to, you know, in all the investigating that we've done throughout the years, we have We've been told that when people get too close to certain principles in this case, that they're shut down or they're told to not look into this or to stay away from it. I mean, it's sort of reminiscent of the the shows that have been made about this type of child exploitation like um, I think it was called the um, the keepers the is keepers. one. What's the one in uh, in Boston right. with the um, with the with the, the Catholic Church? I forget that one was called. That's a, that was a movie. Um, Children of the Snow is in Michigan, and the keepers is in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And I can't think of the the Boston Globe investigation. It's a, it was a very well done movie. Right. Um, about, they're all the same. Where power protects power, you know the power source will try to protect its own nest and it's very difficult to look at the Ramsey investigation and some of the things that were known and uncovered especially in the grand jury investigation oh also true detective season one yeah they that was a fictionalized account of a, a, a true case that happened down in Louisiana yeah but basically the same elements you know protecting people in power child exploitation Right. And that's why the case has never progressed. I mean, you have people arguing on the Internet, you know, intruder, Ramsey's intruder, Ramsey, they toggle back and forth, they get nowhere, or Berg did it. There's enough evidence out there, if there was some sort of aggressive prosecutorial effort made, I think you could learn a lot more about and it. We're also hopeful that because... There have been several cold cases now solved because people putting their genealogical, you know, DNA into these databases. Yeah. That there is a chance that that somebody could, that could get a hit on the Ramsey case because of somebody putting their DNA into one of those ancestry dot places. Yeah, that's that's true. That's probably the best you know possibility at this point. Well, to get, you know, to go into the case that way. But what they were, the remarkable thing about it, Ed, is really, I, I, and you may agree with this, you know, is that for all the noise around the case, people don't know many of the things that we're talking about here. They just they, they just stayed on the surface and said, John Bonet wet the bed, Patsy beat her to death or something like that. You know, Patsy came up with a garrote that nobody in the, you know, very few people in the world could tie and did that to her daughter. It just, they brought in the best criminal minds in America, starting with Dr. Henry Lee to study this case, and he said it doesn't make any sense. There's some piece missing. We think the missing piece is that what has been posited is happening that night is that much more went on than than just you know they took her home they put her in bed and somehow she ends up dead in the basement with a two and a half page ransom note 
there. It does none of that Guys, fits together. I can't thank you enough for your work. We're out of time for, for the work in this book and, and just your overall body of work. Just excellent work. I'm very impressed. Presumed guilty, an investigation of the John Bonet Ramsey case, the media, and the culture of pornography. It's been updated. Uh, you can find them on CNN in July. Uh, September books coming out called Killer Cults. Uh, there's a Reels documentary coming about uh, about the FDLS uh, church and Warren Jeffs. And it's stephensingular.com with a PH uh, where you can find all their upcoming appearances. And stuff. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Good night. And now a word from our sponsors. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I have dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, seven days a week, just log into kmdlaw.com, that's kmdlaw.com, or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW, that's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents, they handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be, because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMDLaw. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMDLaw. Have you ever thought about opening your own mobile cart or kiosk business? Maybe the facility you manage could establish new revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. Cart King International can be the answer to your needs. Cart King is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile coffee, food, and retail carts and kiosks. Cart King has been working with clients and corporations across North America for 20 years, providing innovative designs, custom manufacturing, and timely delivery. Carts and kiosks are fun, and so are the dozens of designs on our website. Please visit us today at www.cart-king.com or just call us at 1-877-986-7771 and get your sales rolling. PureSoapFlakes.com, 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with pure soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. They have a little promotion going on. Contact them to order some soap. Mention the Opperman Report. You're going to get a free gift. They're going to send a little extra soap, travel size, soap bars, and laundry soap, cleaning soap flakes. I've been using that stuff all day long today. Great stuff. Order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call. 218-568-2525. 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. Are you ready to change your life? But don't know how to start? Is your stress and worries keeping you awake at night? Have you been battling grief, anxiety, or depression all alone? Have you lost touch with your own sense of being or spirituality? Soul Free Therapies offers professional and affordable live video streaming counseling and coaching services from the comfort of your own home. Sessions offered in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Go to our website at www.soul-free.com and book your first session today. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. An aqua dam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising floodwaters like a dam, but without the beavers. 
It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. You can look them up online at aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. You call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. 